Afrofuturism is kind of a culmination of historical research, artistic expression, and spirituality. It's like ancestral reverence. Um, you're paying homage to the people that came before you, and you're also creating spaces for the people that will come after you. So um, Afrofuturism and anthropology and history go hand in hand. It's, it's the basis of it. You use history to inspire the art. You know, when I think about um, Afrofuturism and this, the concept of, of ancestral reverence, I see it as, um, as like a, a full cycle. Um, our work that we're doing here is just one piece of this uh, continuum. I think sometimes we get, we get in our own way if we feel like we have to accomplish everything in our lifetime. We're just there to be the bridge. We're there to make sure that nothing gets lost between our generation and the next. And I see Afrofuturism as that same concept, you know, and it shows up in a lot of different ways. Some people are doing virtual reality projects or um, paintings, or photography, and I, it, it can be expressed in a lot of different mediums. But at the core of it, it's saying, I was here, someone else was here before me, and I'm preparing for those who are coming after me. We're essentially doing the work to prepare ourselves to be ancestors. And it's about consciousness. Everything is about consciousness. And these kids are really, these children are really becoming conscious. See, it's about frequency, and I feel that Afrofuturism is on another frequency. Those are the things that we are, are facing right now. Our children, they're on another frequency. They will change things through Afrofuturism. In culture, technology, math, and sciences, it really shows how African people in the African diaspora have contributed to the advancement of civilization overall. It's always evolving and it's defined by the creators. So society can't really dictate what it is. It's out of control. You're telling people, hey, I'm important. This story is important. And what's happening to me right now is connecting to things that have happened thousands of years ago. And some people may not be ready to receive that or ready to connect those dots because it's uncomfortable. But that's what art, that's what artists are supposed to do. <laughs> like artists are not there to make sure everybody is comfortable. Artists are there to reflect back to our culture what is happening in our times. That's it. The reason why art is interesting or useful in social justice is because it gives us a new language um, and it gives us a new perspective, a new way of thinking about things because, and that's how we, how, how we achieve change. So I think about things like the Fair Housing Act, which came out 50 years ago and like, you know, on the linear time scale, we've progressed, right? Um, but we haven't progressed. Actually, we've gone backwards and we're at this standstill now where housing, people's housing rights are just as bad as they've always been, you know, even worse in some ways. I think art is sometimes the only way that people can really start to even reimagine their current reality. So at the time, it was probably about six or eight months after the Keith, Lam Keith Lamont Scott and Justin Carr shootings um, here in Charlotte. So I wanted to tell the story how gentrification was also a form of kind of like that violence that we speak of in police brutality, but also um, gentrification was a, is a social justice issue. So what can I do to kind of like push the dial and get people speaking or seeing it in that way? For me, Afrofuturism was a way of claiming space for people um, from marginalized communities in the future. I have an initiative called Ascend Together in Power, and it is based on basically exploring the spirit, culture, and tradition of black people across all of the African diaspora, and using those findings of who we all are um, as black people to fortify black family units in America. So um, where I start with restoring the black family um, in America is through introspection. I feel like if we know ourselves, if we develop a self-awareness within ourselves individually and we practice, um, practice that self-awareness and we practice daily introspection, then that makes us better individuals within our family units and it impacts the community and then the nation at large and then the world at large as well. I run a digital makerspace uh, an Afrofuturism makerspace called Black Space. Uh, we teach kids things like coding and how to make beats and write poems and co um, 
you know, cryptography and done animation and gaming, all types of stuff. Uh, and the goal is to uh, provide youth of African descent with the tools they need to shape the future. Kids want to know, youth want to know now, you know, about the gods and goddesses. And they're questioning, they're questioning the old uh, Christianity that was put on us in slavery. And we know there's something more out there. I just led a workshop on uh, creating our own Black Liberation Bible, and it, it pulled together folks uh, with different ideas around what text could be included in a new uh, volume of words of inspiration from prophets of different backgrounds. The same folks who, who made religion an exclusive space wanted to create a dominant paradigm for everyone to fall in line behind. That kind of thinking has only led to death and destruction, and so we need to think through a new model. And I think that's what Afrofuturism is all about. So a lot of my artwork features celebrities and very like popular people in black culture, comparing like different actors, rappers, singers with um, their kind of tribal counterparts and so many people related to and identified with it, even some of the celebrities that I featured in it. It got a lot of recognition. Um, it was reposted by a lot of like major blog sites, Afropunk, Blavity, uh, even some of the celebrities that I featured in the series reached out. Um, Alicia Keys um, was in the series. I compared her to um, an Afro-Brazilian woman from the early 1900s, and there was a striking, a striking similarity, and she recognized it and reposted it herself. The more research I do, the more inspiration I have. So it's really, it's not up to me. I feel like I, I make a lot of my artwork with my third eye and then it isn't until after people see it and respond to it that I realize like the full meaning of it. And I started asking my mother if we had any family heirlooms and she really couldn't tell me. And um, at first it did, it did bother me a bit that we didn't know if there were any remnants from the past in our family um, to be passed down. And so after that I sat with it for a little while and I just decided that we should create our own heirlooms to pass down to the future generations. There's something very powerful about having like a physical, tangible artifact that's connected to your family or, for, or connected to a piece of your culture. We have this huge archive of you know, all these newspapers ranging from 1900 to 1914. And there's interviews with Booker T. Washington, W. Du Bois, and Jefferson had this rare books library. And in, in the front page, there's all these inscriptions, and it's his writing, knowing that that's something that he touched, that's something that he wrote for someone that he loved. It reminds me that, that he was thinking about the person that, that was going to hold this book, that he was thinking about who was going to need this information. I started looking into connecting, I guess, my work with like my ancestors, specifically my great-grandmother, Ida DeShields Moore. I was, I was really inspired by her story. She was one of the first, she was part of the first class of registered black nurses to graduate in the state of North Carolina in the 1930s. So this was essentially a black woman in the South that graduated with a professional medical degree. Um, and she had to be an Afrofuturist in herself because she came from a, a background of sharecroppers. So, um, I think, I guess, when I think about ancestry or being a future ancestor, you have to think about a potential that's beyond your current circumstance. How can you push your descendants into a position that they could do the same thing? Even if it's not dealing with time specifically, um, Afrofuturism in and of itself is a different way of experiencing time. That's just, it's going to naturally be embedded in that work um, that makes me feel more whole and more positive when I'm dealing with it than if I'm watching some other kind of ingesting some other kind of um, vision or version of the future that, that I don't belong to. Black history or the histories of people of color uh, in relation to colonialism and uh, life in America is very dark because there are a lot of uh, struggles involved in that. Afrofuturism offers a chance for you to express it artistically and bring out the beauty in it, the resilience of the people. Also, the beauty in the future that we are creating from those experiences.
there is something really interesting about framing that under Afrofuturism, that we're there to collect a lot of different pieces and make it our own. Um, and I think that's what makes it so powerful. It's, uh, it's an opportunity to carve a path for yourself in a way that we m may not have been able to do, you know, several hundred years ago. It's about us reclaiming our story. So sometimes that might mean that we're reimagining ourselves or even our ancestors as these folklore um, deities um, that exist in the now, um, but they also exist in the present and in the past. And, and the, all these people are connected through your DNA. This is how you time travel. This is how you get that knowledge and information from your ancestors. Um, so the, the reimagining concept, it's, for me, it's a, it's a way, it's a form of empowerment. Um, how do we keep people empowered in visions of themselves and recreate internal narratives that maybe society has been kind of abusive with um, and re redirect people to where they're lifted up internally and reclaim their stories. Though the term did not exist at the time, I think of uh, Harriet Tubman as an Afrofuturist and she certainly wielded the technology of her time to liberate her people. Um, you know, and that technology included um, an understanding of the cosmos, knowing how to read the stars to follow a pathway to freedom. That included, you know, detective work, knowing when to move and how to operate the, the weapons of her time. That There's legends of her carrying shotguns and pistols and, um, you know, these were all tools and technologies that haven't, they haven't always existed. Um, but we've used what tools were available to us to get free, and social media is just another tool. Uh, since Afrofuturism is like so deeply rooted in like science and technological advancement, um, I think that it's perfect for the internet age and um, this information highway that we have. Um, and I like the fact that it also assists in distributing historical information. I don't know, social media gives, allows you to interact with people on a different level. You can kind of get straight to the point on social media. I just won a science award uh, for four-year research. Uh, we, it was STEM for all, and we did a video. We're the most, uh, the popular choice in videos with the National Science Foundation. And science is not just for the dominant culture, it's also for us. The ancient Egyptians did science. We must know that we are what we think. You know, we are what we think. We become what we eat. So we have to master ourselves. And that's what the youth is looking at, to master ourselves on this planet Earth and beyond.